from uh, Psalm 100. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. There is a about the readings before we hear them and uh, they're not terribly easy um, the theme of uh, judgment uh, comes up but um, we mustn't uh, avoid what it says in fact 
in the end, it's all good news, as we shall see. The Gospel reading is um, the parable of the weeds, or as I always call it, the wheat and the tares, because I'm of an age when the um, King James Version still lived on. Tares just means weeds, but I always call it the wheat and the tares. And there are the words of Jesus saying, life has got both the wheat and the tares. And um, Jesus is asked, you know, what should we do about the, uh, about the, the weeds? And he sets it all in the context of what is to come. But he says that evil and good are inextricably mixed together and we need to look beyond the world as we know it to see how it all fits together. So that's the um, gospel reading. Epistle is one of the great chapters from the Bible, the eighth chapter of Romans. And I often think if I, can understand, if I could understand that chapter, I really would understand what it is all about. But it's um, Paul writing to the church in Rome and a similar kind of theme about the, uh, the way there is evil and there is good in life. And um, it's unresolved. And Paul writes saying the creation is at present subject to frustration. But if we look beyond, then we'll see it will be liberated from decay. If we see the world as it is in its wider context, Paul can say about we will be brought into the freedom and the glory of the children of God. The Parable of Weeds Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seeds in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed as then the weeds also appeared the owner's servant came to him and said sir didn't you sow good seeds in your field where then did the weeds came from an enemy did this he replied the servants asked him do you want us to go and pull them up no he repl he answered because while you are pulling the weeds you may root up the weeds with them Let's both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvester, first collect the wheat and tie them up in a bundle to be burned. Then gather the weeds and bring it into my barn. Amen. Then he left the crowd and went into the house. His disciple came to him and said, Explain us the parable of weed in the field. He answered, the one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weed are the people of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed is the devil. The harvest is the end of age, and harvester are angels. As the weed are pulled up and burned into the fire, so it will be at the end of age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out his king, of his kingdom everything that curse sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the blazing furnace, and there will be weeping and gushing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like sun in the kingdom of their Father, who has ears, let them hear. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in the field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and brought the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like the merchant looking for fine pearl. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and brought it. This is the word of the God. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it's not to the sinful nature, to live according to it. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. 
The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we are saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what we have already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. Wesley in early Methodism was very keen on scriptural holiness and that's something which has tended to fade I think over the past 50 years or so but if you go back to Methodism more than 50 years ago scriptural holiness was a great theme early Methodism was a holiness me um, movement right so that doesn't mean you have to all into turn into saints doing that kind of thing what it means is that we make doing right our first priority even when it costs. And that revolutionized so many lives and even society in the first few hundred years of, of Methodism. Really powerful. Uh, but in general, most people want to, to do right as far as they can. And that's absolutely crucial. And how does that foster that? How do we foster that? How do we build society and structures and our own decision making that will avoid climate change? the catastrophe for instance it's all sort of in the balance and this sense of good and evil is, uh, is so important and that's why I think one reason why we should take our readings today seriously talk of good and evil and what you do about it and it can be painful what you do about it but if we just let evil run riot then uh, we're in big trouble there is both good and evil, and we take both seriously. And the gospel recognizes this mixture. There's the wheat and the tares, the weeds, and they exist together. So the farmer planted good seed, and then after a while, uh, the servants came up to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? And they're saying to the farmer, Well, go, go ahead and tear up the weeds. That's the answer to it. Just tear up the weeds. 
And he said, no, because while you are pulling up the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. That's the problem. Good and evil are so intermingled. And it's not just that some people are good, some people are bad. It's that each of us within ourselves is both good and bad. And you can't tear out the bad without destroying the good. So somehow I have to, have to work with it. And God has to work in us to, um, uh, to, to live with this and get, bring out a good result in the end. And so Jesus said at the end, the Son of Man will send out his angels and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. Well, you can get into the next life and all sorts of things like that. But what it says in general is there, there is a wider context. There is not just the life that we immediately see in front of us. There is a wider context. And somehow in the end, that uh, the kingdom of love will triumph. And somehow evil will be dealt with. And for comfort, I think this is where we turn to the cross. Because the message of the cross is that good and evil do matter. Jesus didn't go to the cross on a whim. He went because it had to be done. Evil had to be dealt with. And he gave his own life for it. And the other thing he said by going to the cross was that the weeding out will be done in love. If we fear what it means to have the evil dealt with inside ourselves, the sin, then we should take comfort in the fact that Jesus dealt with it and he dealt with it by taking the pain onto himself. And I think we can get reassurance from that. Now to turn to the, um, Paul's letter to the Romans. A similar kind of thing, that good and evil coexist talked about living according to the flesh or living according to the spirit and he has the same confidence that in the end good will triumph but he gives some pictures about how good is advancing now and Jesus gave the picture of the wheat and the tares Paul gave a picture another agricultural picture of the first fruits when you have the harvest uh, particularly those times they used to have a celebration of when the first fruits came the first harvest the first part of the harvest the rest will come later but he says that we that his followers are the first fruits of a harvest to come another picture he gave Paul gave was about creation giving birth to new life he wrote we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time well I have no personal experience of childbirth, but from what I've seen, it can be painful, but the results are wonderful. And I think that's basically Paul's, Paul's message there. And he has another picture, which is a little bit more frightening, because it involves fire. You remember fire being in the Gospel reading, that the evil will be burnt up. Fire isn't just for... It's not, in those words, it's not punishment. It's purification. And I'll, I'll read you a, a couple of verses from uh, Paul's letter to the Corinthians. And he says, if any, about how we live our lives. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay or straw, their work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be re revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives the builder will receive a reward if it is burned up the builder will suffer loss but yet will be saved even though only as one escaping through the flames all right and that refers back to proverbs 17 which some words there say the crucible for silver and the furnace for gold but the law tests the heart of heart of his child Right. There's also a hymn, which we might have sung, but it's, it's not really a congregational hymn. But the point there is that the fire is not for punishing, it's for refining. So if, if you want to refine gold, you heat it up, all the nasty stuff floats to the surface, and you scrape it off. And that's what the fire is about. It can be a difficult process, but if you want to get rid of, of that nasty stuff, then... The process has to go through. And it's been in the history of God's people right through from the Old Testament 
particularly about being refined and being purified. So Paul had no doubt that it was necessarily a struggle, but the end result would be glorious. As he writes, the hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. For Paul, sin is slavery, and we need to be released from that slavery. But the end point is nothing but positive. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. But Paul's point is that we have the consequences for, for us now. And as he begins that passage we heard, he wrote, Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if, the spirit you put, if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeed, misdeeds of the body, you will live. Right, that's, that's pretty heavy stuff. But that takes me back to, you can say one of the great gifts of Methodism to the world has been its sense of scriptural holiness. It had a big part in the abolition of, of slavery, of the freeing of people's lives from uh, um, alcoholism, you know, when people sort of um, took on the Methodist way of life and in educating kids has a big, very big effect. And uh, the focus there is on being refined, acknowledging sin in our lives and cooperating in the process of this sin rising, bringing it to the, visibly to the surface and having it scraped away. But um, on this day, we are called to renew our faith and our commitment to living a life of holiness and righteousness. And I think it's a focus of early Methodism that we do well to recover today. Amen. Lord, we bring before you our world in all its complexity, in its mixture of good and bad, and we pray that you will lead us towards the good and into setting aside the bad. We ask for this in global politics as we construct the world order between east and west and north and south, and in our efforts to fight climate change before its dire consequences overtake this planet. And we pray that you will guide us, that you will lead us, that you will refine us as people and society. Help us as we offer ourselves in your service. Purify and refine us, and may we not hold back. May the church be a light to the world and a city on a hill. May we be the body of Christ present in the world. May we be the branches of the vine growing the fruits of the Spirit. May we be the temple in which Christ lives. We thank you that you care for each of us individually, and we thank you that we can bring our particular concerns to you. We hold before you our locality, the community in which we live, the people we know, the people we work with and share projects with, those we care about most among our friends and our families, and our children and grandchildren that are so important to us. And also we hold before you the concerns we have. You know who is in our hearts. We ask you to bless them, encourage them, share your love with them. Lord, we place all these matters in your hands because we believe that you love us and in Jesus you died for us and in Jesus you rose again Lord we make all these prayers in the name of our Lord Jesus thankful that you watch over us and you love us Amen Gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness, and freedom. My steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. For my life is holy unto to
is dark, but I am not forsaken. For by my side, the Savior, He will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing. For in my need, His power is displayed. To this I hold, my shepherd will defend me. Through the deepest valley, He will lead. Oh, the night has been won, and I shall overcome. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. No fate I dread. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. And the blessing of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with us all now and always. Amen.